Welcome, everybody. We're here for the Global Wellness Summit podcast. I'm your host, Kim Marshall. I'm the co-founder of Swell the Agency. And of course, I always say I'm a wellness storyteller. But our guest today is a big shot in the medical world. And what's so thrilling to me is that about the same time Susie Ellis and I started in the wellness slash fitness slash spa world, that was like 1987, 89, 91 uh, Dr. Royson was just beginning to understand in the medical field that choices, patient choices make a difference. So let's go with Dr. Royson on this journey. First, a minute about who he is. You might recognize Dr. Royson from his appearances over the years on, oh, I don't know, little shows like Oprah Winfrey, Dr. Oz, uh, so many others. He's a physician and an author. His real devotion is to helping people live younger and longer. You know what? He's the guy who coined the term real age. He developed a questionnaire that calculates how your lifestyle choices impact the length of your life. And I mean, hundreds of millions of people took that test. So you used to see it at realage.com. Um, he started. It's today. now. It's it's now. By the way, at sharecare.com, it's on forty-five million uh, phones in the U.S. and. 17 million more worldwide. See, I told you. We're going to hear so much from him. He used to say 60 can be the new 40. He has the nerve to tease us and say 90 will be the new 40. But guess what? It's backed up by science. We are um, talking to a self-described science nerd, Dr. Royzen. I don't know. He wrote nine books on the New York Times bestseller list. And four of them were number one bestsellers. Maybe you've heard of them. Real Age, Are You As Young As You Can Be?, Age Proof, Living Longer Without Breaking a Hip or Running Out of Money, and then the popular What to Eat When. And his next one is really going to be called The Great Age Reboot. And we're going to focus on that today. Dr. Royzen, welcome to the podcast. Kim, what a great introduction. Thank you. <laughs> well, I hope I live up to it. Well, you will. I have my I have my feelings. Let me tell you, I was there in Boston in December. When you welcomed the crowd, you were co-chair of the Global Wellness Summit in 2021, and your talk was, you're younger than you think, silver linings from um, post-pandemic, and you left the audience wanting for more. So let's give them that today, okay? Absolutely. All right, we're going to start with your origin story. I was born in Ohio. I don't tell many people that, Dr. Royston, but where were you born? I was born in Buffalo, New York. Ah, I hear that. And so I was born, uh, if you will, um, at uh, whatever hospital I was born at. It's the wrong number on my security code for uh, when I go on. They ask you security questions on some of the websites that make sure it's you. Yep. And I always get where what what hospital I was born in wrong. So I have no idea what I answered, <laughs> but I get it wrong and I get locked out constantly. Oh no, we're going to have to do some research. Now tell us, what do you think about your childhood led you to a wife, uh, a wife, a life of wellness seeking? What was it? Do you think? Well, it actually, when I was nine years old, I was sicker than a dog and oh. a pediatrician came over, uh, gave me a shot, probably with streptomycin or penicillin. That was the early era of that. And six hours later, I felt great. And I said, man, that's what I want to do. I can help people feel great. Um, and uh, so that's that's what motivated it. It was solely that pediatrician, a guy named Dick Fisher. Oh, wow. So he started it all. Now, what do you think? Um, you're a science nerd, but I read that your family are brainiacs too. I mean, your wife is a de developmental pediatrician. Your two daughters. She, she actually, I've got to just, give a few more things on her. So she uh, not only is a developmental pediatrician, but she was chair for uh, a number of years, 12 or 14 years before she uh, gave them notice a couple of years ago and just recently uh, stopped uh, going to all the meetings of chairs. So she was chair of the de Department of Developmental Pediatrics and uh, I think psychology at uh, Case Western Reserve University. Um, but she got the Pediatrician of the Year Award, a Distinguished Pediatrician of the Year Award from the Society this year. So uh, she really, she she is uh, even more in demand than I am. 
Oh, my goodness. Well, how about Jenny, your daughter, a PhD in organic chemistry? What? And let's see. She yeah. Actually, uh, I, I, I'm probably not allowed to tell you where she works other than it's the Department of Energy or what oh. she does. Okay. Well, we can hope for the best there. There's a lot to do. And then your son, Jeffrey, what does he do? He's an MD, PhD, uh, who's in the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia CHOP as a pediatric endocrinologist. So what were those dinners like around the table? What were you saying? We have to solve the problems of the world. Look how fun it is to learn. What was it? We mainly talked about uh, Chicago sports in that era. Of they, they both grew up in Hyde Park near the University of Chicago, which is a wonderfully intellectual area. But we talked a lot about uh, sports and how Michael Jordan actually and the uh, Chicago Bears um, changed the tenure of a tenor of a, a whole town uh, by saying Michael Jordan and the Bears, it was OK to be a workaholic. Um, and to excel at that, the craft and to really push hard to excel at it. And that's what they did. And they, they really changed the tenor of the town in that era. It is crazy. I will tell you, um, it is wonderful to challenge a child to something because they typically rise to the occasion, don't they? Um, now, I read that you became certified in internal medicine and anesthesiology. Now that an internist, for those uh, people that don't know, you diagnose and treat disease and sickness, but you don't do surgery. But an anesthesiologist provides care before and after surgery. Surgery. So how did these two specialties well, lead to well, wellness? Well, I wanted to. I wanted to run an ICU, and in that era, there weren't ICU training programs. Um, and so I didn't think the domain of either anesthesia or internal medicine was enough to run an ICU that you needed the, the domains or the knowledge sets of both. And so I was lucky enough to do that. Um, and so uh, that's why, that's how I got into the whole area. Oh my goodness. Well, you also are a professor, right? Uh, Learner College of Medicine, um, Case Western Reserve. What do you love most about teaching, Dr. Royzen? Um, the kids, uh, always stimulate you. Yeah. They ask questions that, uh, bring up other issues that you hadn't thought about. And, uh, they're willing to, uh, uh, work their tails off to, uh, help find answers and to, and to actually stimulate, uh, and move the whole field and innovation forward. Oh, my goodness. There was a wonderful movie, a foreign film. Susie loves um, the World Happiness Day, and Bhutan is supposed to be the country with the most happiness, right? The happy, gross national happiness. Their entry into the Oscars was nominated for Best International Film. It was a teacher who had to do an eight-day hike to teach in a village, and he didn't want to do it. He was just assigned by the government. He was a young kid that didn't want to be a teacher but forced to. When he got there, the chief of the village and the kids all revered him because they were taught that teachers are the future and it changed his whole life. Such a good film, such a good film. So as a teacher, you should watch it. Now, what about the Global Wellness Institute? And so well, we really all are teachers, right? I mean, everyone listening here can help spread um, what they learn about wellness to other people. So um, we're all teachers, and, and I, I look at it as we all have that privilege of teaching other people what we learn. Yeah, it's the least we can do, right? It's the least we can do when we benefit. It is a privilege. Uh, yeah. So, okay, you are very involved, and you're a supporter of the Global Wellness Institute and the Summit. Why do you attend? Why do you go? Um, again, it, it is a uh, combination of people um, and thoughts that you don't normally get. I mean, every there, there's just such a wide range represented and a, a skillful and thoughtful group um, that it's not just medicine, it's not just uh, spas, it's not just skin, it's not just brain, it's not just hair, it's, it's the full thing. Um, and uh, it, it leaves you, how do I call it? And, and Susie and, uh, if you will, Nancy put together a probably the craziest combination of 
uh, speakers, etc. You never think, what the hell is this person, if you put the expression, <laughs> doing there? And then all of a sudden you find out what they're doing there. And it is totally, I mean, you know, what the heck was a space, was an astronaut doing on the podium the last time? That's right. And all of a sudden you learn about what he's done with circadian rhythms and how that affects our well-being. Um, and you, and you, you have, anyway, the, it is such a wide variation that you don't expect. I could give probably 40 examples yeah. like that. What's someone talking about uh, red light doing there um, and a sauna? Um, you know, in other words, what does that have to do with what all of us do? And it's integrally, the data is integrally related. And, and so you learn so, so much um, each time I go. Yeah. I mean, from real estate to dying well to health before conception, it's crazy. And it's it's very, very exciting. But, you know, your role as a medical professional is so crucial. When Susie and I started, you know, we were in the spa world and we used to say that spas were hospitals for healthy people. But until we got the medical community involved, we wouldn't have been taken seriously. But about that time, you were percolating the same kind of word that Susie and us were, and that is wellness. You were the Cleveland Clinic's first chief wellness officer and your chair of its wellness institute. What gave you the idea to use the word wellness? Um, in uh, 2005, I came to the Cleveland Clinic as chair of... Uh, anesthesia, critical care, pain management, and executive health. And to give you the idea of, of the Cleveland Clinic at its main campus, and that day we did, uh, I think we did 168,000 operations, 44,000 critical care days, 110,000 pain therapy patients. Huge operation. Um, but Toby uh, said, and, and so we were motivating, and they had grabbed onto real age way before anyone else virtually because they cared about outcome. That is, the Cleveland Clinic ba based its skill set and its growth on how fast can we get patients to return to a normal life and what is the technique and then sharing all the data with everyone so that everyone learns from the best uh, practitioners. And so they actually had, uh, I had uh, brought transesophageal echo with Mike Cahalan and Bill Hamilton over from the Thorax Center in 1978 or 79, and which is now a standard technique. But um, they had started to recruit me in 79 and 83 and 87, uh, literally six times before I said yes. And then when I got there, Toby said, uh, we should form new institutes. Um, and that is, we shouldn't have a patient who comes for with chest pain, debating whether to go to cardiac surgery or to get a stent or to get medically managed, we should have one entry point for everything. So we formed a cardiovascular institute, but he said we should also form some new ones. So I submitted the idea for a wellness institute because um, I was running anesthesia, critical care, pain management, and executive health, uh, unusual combination. But it is wellness that keeps people out of needing health care. The only way we're going to reduce our total health care bill as a world is to keep people well enough so they don't need medical care yeah, or to motivate people to be well enough. And so I proposed a wellness institute. And one of the key things is he not only grabbed onto it, he um, endorsed it totally and it, it teaches you to go big right from the beginning, because instead of trying to push things in, he said, let's do this in a way that motivates our employees, motivates everyone. And he stuck by it. And so that's how we've motivated. We went from 6% of people having what we call six normals plus two to 43 plus percent having it from 12% participating in a chronic disease management program to 77% doing it from, and we've saved, we have not spent um, about $190 million a year. Um, let me repeat that over in the 10 years, over 1.4 billion now 
um, and saved uh, each employee another 200 and 50 million over that period of time, not each employee, but all the employees together, um, roughly 50 million a year now in um, premiums health. on health costs. So, and the reason is by, because if you don't need health care, compared to our trend line, compared to national averages, we're 38% lower um, in our employee health needs, if you will. Huge so you've difference. got the numbers to back up workplace wellness. You were a pioneer in that space. And that's not a small thing. I mean, Susie said she visited you. There's 173 acres on the main campus of the Cleveland Clinic, 4,600 4, doctors and 68,000 employees. So that's a lot of people's lives to change, right? Yeah, it's actually now 100 and about 12,000 people. We have 11 hospitals in Northeast Ohio, five in Florida. Um, we serve five in Abu Dhabi. We have a big center in Toronto, a big center in Las Vegas for brain. And we just opened uh, today a hospital in London. That's crazy. You know, it's touched my life, the Cleveland Clinic. I had, being raised in Ohio, that is where my mother was treated for an aortic aneurysm and my young brother had brain surgery there. So it's always been such a, you know, monument to, you know, when you really need help uh, medically. But well, me that's it. That's so as Toby Cosgrove said, I mean, our CEO really said it is if all we do is help people who need help the most, we aren't serving the community best. We've got to get people to understand that they can stay healthy much longer than they expect. And so he is the one who drove um, the changes for both patients and uh, employees and families. Well, I cannot wait to get into the choices and the future and the science that you say we can hang our hat on to make 90 the new 40. But in the meanwhile, I because I'm a communicator, you know, I keep saying I'm a wellness storyteller. You've got me beat by a mile. I see here that you are the recipient of an Emmy and Ellie and the Paul Rogers, Rogers Best Medical Communicator Award from the National Library of Medicine. And let me say, let me think if this is why. 1,200 lectures. Let's see. You've appeared not just on Oprah, but the Today Show 2020, CNN, CBS, Good Morning America, blah, 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 PBS and lots and lots of magazines, a weekly uh, column in newspapers that about a hundred different newspapers. It's not, it's not a weekly column. It's a daily column. What? So it's uh, seven days. It's now six days a week. I cut out the feature when Dr. Oz decided to run for Senate. We used to write it together. And when he <laughs> decided to run for Senate, I had to, I've had to pick it up myself. And Ow. so it's a daily column for, it's about 104 newspapers have it on their website or carry it. How many words do you turn in a day? It's 250 uh, five days a week. And on Saturdays, it's 750. Oh, please. Oh, please. Uh, talk about deadlines. But let's not, let's just, okay, you write that. But your podcast is called You, the Owner's Manual um, on, let's see, Radio MD. How often do you do that? Um, we record it. It's released every Tuesday. And uh, we've done it over 20 years. So it's uh, it, it's in its, yesterday I recorded the 1090 of News of the Week and 1091 of a guest segment. So we're usually about two weeks ahead, but we do uh, 20 minutes. What's the latest medical news of the week and what it means to you? That's uh, on You, the Owner's Manual. And uh the uh, guest was uh, the guest was a wonderful guest yesterday. Uh, talked about radical intimacy. It's a wonderful oh, book. Wow! So uh, Zoe uh, Kors um, was the guest. I've been fortunate enough to have great medical guests. Uh, so and uh, usually I get to read a book a week on, on uh, what they write, and I I do my homework as a as you know I'm a People say, what do you do for fun? And I read medicine for fun. <laughs> I don't now, tell you. Now, but you, now, have, I, uh, you also play squash, right? Well, I stopped that in, uh, competitively. I'll tell you that story too. But I uh, I do go to, uh, we, had, we do have season tickets to the Cavs, which is our local uh, pro basketball team, right, the right, Browns right. and the uh, Indians. 
And I may be the only one who uh, we've seen every timeout routine, obviously, if you go to 41 games a year. So uh, during the timeouts, I read medicine. So I mean, oh, it's my God. Well, you have to you have to keep on top of it. But why do you do so much talking? How can we learn from you to help make wellness more appealing and understandable to the masses? What can we learn? Well, you know, the, the, the basic message is you're going to get to stay younger and you ought to have as much function as you can. In other words, we're going to, in, in whether it's in 2050 or sometime, but in the next 10 years, we're going to get with at least an 80% probability to be able to make 90 the new 40. What I mean by that is we, believe it or not, we started that phrase in 1993 or so when we started Real Age um, saying, this is what the data show that you can change your rate of aging significantly. Well, now you're going to get, and, and the reason is you get to control your genes. So let me go and do one minute on that. Um, no, wait, wait, wait. We can't go there yet. We're going to do the lightning round. Remember? We're going to okay. talk about that. But what I want to know is, what is your philosophy for sh communicating about wellness? Why do you do so much of it? Why, why? Well, it's because it ne it's got a, a lot of sink in power, right? Because it takes a while to get people to understand that it is the long-term benefit also is a short-term benefit. So people say, well, I can have ice cream today or I can have brain function tomorrow. Um, if you will. And so that's the trade-off. And you got to understand that you're going to really have a lot of disability if you uh, don't try and do healthy things. And so the whole goal is to make healthy things a lot of fun. That's what the spa industry does. Yep. It's great, right? That's what, in fact, medicine should be doing instead of saying, oh, you take that right. You know, instead of being uh, negative Nellies, if you will, you want to be, and we can be positive about it. And so what I want to, I mean, what my role is, is to celebrate, um, health and to celebrate the choices you have so that you understand, let me, let me go and just, I don't know if I'm doing a lightning round with food. I, if, if I got, if I was supposed to get a uh, information packet on what I was doing, I didn't get it or I didn't get a chance <laughs> no, to read no. it. No, but... no, I just, I know that you have so many scientific tips. I just really want to know um, <coughs> some of the things like you said during the pandemic, there was a weight gain that was shocking in America. Do you remember what that is? Oh, sure. The, in the, in the first, in March 20 to March 21, it was on average, the Americans gained 19 pounds, um, with 50% of people gaining 29 or more pounds. It was incredible. So obviously a, a bunch of people didn't gain any, I didn't gain any weight. Well, that means somebody else gained 38 pounds, right? So, um, if you will, so huge, uh, weight gain during the pandemic. So, but in, in the, the, key point is to make it fun. So you should only eat food. Food's a relationship. It's just like a marriage. You wouldn't marry someone who's trying to kill you every day. You shouldn't eat food that's trying to kill you every day. If, if, if you, you may love French fries, but they're trying to kill you. So what you want is to find something you love that is also good for you. Avocados. That's who your partner is. Someone who you love, who's good for you, who watches your back. Those are the trusted partners you have. And that's what you want to have. You always talk about beautiful chocolate too. You know, natural dark chocolate. You talk about blueberries. These are all happy foods that we can learn to oh, love, right? Absolutely. Another headline. This week's Wall Street Journal, Dr. Roizen, said stopping a pandemic deadlier than COVID. And the writer Tom Frieden said, Cardiovascular disease kills more people each year than COVID at its worst. We know how to prevent it. We just need the political will. And there was a picture of a salt shaker and a cigarette lit. Can you unpack that for us? Sure. Um, the Global Wellness Institute start, had a goal of eliminating a moonshot, eliminating preventable disease. If you look at the data that we started with, which was the Chicago Public Employees Union data from 1946 
or the nurse's health study data that started in around ni- in the mid 1980s or the health professional study. If you choose just and get to six healthy, what we call six normals, you reduce your risk of chronic disease and the low end between 80, at 80% and on the high end 90% in those studies. So just imagine eliminating 80 to 90% of disease and costs and decline in human capital by just doing those things. So that, so, and, and Tom Frieden had two important things. One was, in fact, uh, the cigarettes, which he did and helped with in New York City. And the other is uh, salt. I think um, he should have had a bottle of, of water or uh, coffee or lemon water, whatever, um, because that prevents a lot of the high fructose from turning into uric acid and hurting your kidney. So we've learned a ton in the last few years about why you get high blood pressure as we get older. And it isn't just salt and it isn't just smoking or alcohol. A lot of it is the sugar and producing uric acid, which if we had water, we could flush it out. If we ate water every day, it's not eating seven tons of water on Sunday and thinking that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are going to go away. No, it is continually. Um, so we've, we've, we haven't pushed enough in medicine on how important some of these things that we're learning of late are to eliminating preventable disease. So but what are you, the six things? Tell us the six. We'll write them down. Normal blood pressure, normal LDL cholesterol, or normal apolipoprotein B, um, normal um, fasting blood sugar or hemoglobin A1C or never getting a one a postprandial glucose above 140. Um, the uh, um, body mass index that isn't in the obese range, that is keep your body mass index below 30, um, no cotinine, tobacco end products in the urine, and then do a stress management program and routinely practice stress management. Okay, so, so here's things- we go. The normal blood pressure, good cholesterol, uh, good blood sugar, don't be obese, don't smoke, and learn how to manage stress. Would that be? Yeah. Yeah. yeah those, are, those are the six. And then the two are seeing a primary care practitioner and um, immunizations up to date. So um, if you do those six things, uh, plus two, six normals plus two, you get the six normals and you do those two things, you're, uh, you've got the risk, your risk reduction for chronic disease. You don't eliminate it. But it's a 90, it's between 80 and 90% reduction. That's the, the keys or the moonshot of eliminating preventable disease. And as Tom Frieden said, um, more people die of preventable disease by a long shot than died of any uh, virus. And it's just a matter of us finding fun ways to do those things. So we often say to patients, You know, we've got a ton of blood, we have 150 blood pressure medicines approved. What side effects do you want? Everyone's got a side effect. So you want increase, you want increased libido. We got a pill that does that. You want decreased libido. We got a pill that does that. So we can do any of the, we we literally um, tell your physician or your practitioner what you want in those things, what you're willing to take, what you want as a, as a end result in addition to normal blood pressure or in addition to a normal LDL or apolipoprotein B, and you can get it. Well, also exercise plays such a role in these six things. It is so crazy. Uh, One physician told me if exercise was a prescription, I would write it for everyone. And we we know that's totally true. Um, But we do write those prescriptions. So, and there are four components of physical activity that make a difference to how long and well you live. Any such as walking, I'm on a treadmill now, so I can show you. I have a desk that's a treadmill desk, and I walk on that the majority of the time. I'll just show you. For, <laughs> I uh, love little, it. It's so a cool. Little bit. Um, and then um, I'll just do it for a minute so people don't get crazed. Um, the second thing is uh, resistance activity that is strengthening. The third is um, cardio, 
And uh, the fourth is jumping. Uh, it's the only thing that strengthens our uh, jumping on a hard surface. Um, it's the only thing that strengthens bones um, in your hip and uh, keeps discs lubricated. So um, that's the one that is uh, most surprising to people. It's only 40 jumps, 20 in the morning, 20 in the evening. Uh, my wife does it every time uh, she gets in a car and gets out of the car in the morning and the evening. So is it a jumping jack? Because I'm going to start doing it. Jumping jack is just fine. But not a trampoline because it's not a hard surface. Is that it? Right. And oh. if you run, it's running between 3.8 and 6.3 miles per hour. If you run slower than that, you don't get enough of a, of a bump on your uh, bones. And if you run faster than that, you're gliding and you don't get enough of a bump. Okay. You've changed my life. My poor dogs are going to wonder what I'm doing, but you know, I really, I really want to get this going because so many people get stopped and they think I'll never do that. I can't take advantage. Dr. Royson is saying these people can live so long, but I won't be able to afford these tests or, or these areas of research. So overwhelmingly you say it's choices. So now let's talk about how longevity could be the next disruptor by doing a lightning round of the 14 areas of research that you say are going to make all the difference. So give us a quick definition. We'll start with stem cell production with immune immunogenicity. I'm scared to say that. What does that mean? Uh, with no immunogenicity. So stem cells are cells that um, repair and that we come from. So essentially one stem cell caused all of the body and you've got the genome in that, in your cells. Um, you've got 22,500 genes, only 1500 of them are turned on producing proteins or watching other genes at any one time, which ones are on or not is to a large degree your choice. But the stem cells, if you have an injured heart and you restore blood flow fast enough, that's why we want you to get to the hospital fast for your heart or brain, then you're set, it, there are growth factors that uh, are called and they generate stem cells to come to that area and they repair it. If you use all your stem cells on burnt skin, you got sunburn when you were young and you used all your stem cells, you don't have any. But imagine if we could find sheets of stem cells, by the way, when you think about stem cells, you don't need 8,000, which is the typical American uh, stem cell factory production. You need 20 to 30 million. And so you need to grow them in culture. So if we could have, if we could have a factory that grew new heart cells and we could just inject them around your heart and do, well, what's the problem? Well, you, they have, um, you're going to reject them because you've got an immune system. But if you can grow stem cells, that have none of the what we call the the G the the um, AHG the immune sense the immune stimulants on them, then we could grow. We could literally have a factory where we produce stem cells for everyone for their heart, or so stem you, cells for everyone for their brain, or stem cells for everyone for their ex, and repair all the injuries. So you're and saying that's, that's going, going on right now. That's going on. Going now. on in Japan right now. Tests of it in Japan are occurring. Okay, number two, autophagy with and without intermittent fasting. Autophagy so, no, starvation. Auto, what? Autophagy, what's that? Autophagy is essentially you recycle old cells. Oh, okay. So it is, you put the, the products of the cells, the protein, the amino acids, and you essentially, they're the supply chain to build new cells. One of the easiest ways of doing it is Five days of low calories done by Walt, Walter Logo. Walter Longo was the key in this. Five days of uh, 750 calories a day and then re-eating Mediterranean afterwards. Some spas should do this. Wouldn't that be great if a, a group of spas said, we're going to do um, the five-day extended fast, the five days intermittent fast. And you can come and learn to do that. And then we'll um, give you celebration dinners. And uh, you come on a Sunday, you uh, fast or you get young during the week. And then you go home and you'll uh, you do it once a month or once a quarter, depending on your age. And you recycle old products. That is not far-fetched at all. So many people are doing intermittent fasting. Okay, third one, senolytics, including therapeutic plasma exchange. 
So the AMBAR study, which started in Spain, uh, two centers in Spain, two in Chile, two in the United States, University of Pittsburgh and Cleveland Clinic, um, reversed brain aging. So in patients with mild uh, dementia, mild Alzheimer's disease, they actually improved over 15 months after uh, five months of treatment, once a week for five weeks and then once a month for the next uh, five months. Um, And what it is is getting rid of misfolded proteins, we think. But it is when you have old cells, senile cells, they make the cells around them old. And by getting rid of them and what they produce, the proteins they produce, that's the theory of young blood, but you can do it with just plasma exchange where you keep your red cells. And so the AMBAR study did this randomized controlled study, and now they're in an AMBAR 2. Um, the FDA has said that if they, in another phase 3 study, the FDA has, I understand, has said that if they get uh, the same results with this study, that that will be the... Uh, approved treatment for mild dementia. So getting rid of aging cells because you aging and I don't- plasma and Aging cells. plasma. You and I don't have those, but a lot of people do, right? We're staying young forever. Okay. Uh, I unfortunately, um, I, I, everyone has, you know, we start producing them in utero, but our immune system gets rid of them until about age 30. After age 30, we start accumulating them. Our immune system isn't as good. So one of the keys is getting our immune system to get rid of them longer. We haven't figured out how to do that. But in fact, um, if you will, hormone therapy replacement in estrogen for women with aspirin and uh, uh, testosterone in men seems to actually upgrade your immune system. It's another area of work, but it's a whole different lecture. Oh, my God. I cannot wait. Okay. Gene editing, splicing, right? Isn't that what the... Well, Gene, so CRISPR-Cas9 plus giving a, a with a adverse, an, a, a newer technique um, with people, a third of people, not quite a third, 25 to 30% of people with heart failure are producing an abnormal protein, an abnormal amyloid that is in the heart and causes heart failure. Um, if you edit out that gene that makes that abnormal protein, you get rid of the heart failure in animals. It's now been done in six humans in Australia and Bango. Instead of having a six-month life expectancy, they now have an 18-year life expectancy. So exciting. Induced tissue regeneration. So take your epigenes, which get abnormal as you get older and they cause you to not have as much energy production. Why can't we keep up with the five-year-old kid? Um, because we don't produce as many as much ATP from our mitochondria from fat and glucose because we've injured our mitochondria. Well, imagine you can regress your mito your control of your mitochondria back to when you were five years old. That's what's happened in animal species. Coleco now at at uh, the Google Moonshot company that is involved in aging has now reproduced what uh, San Diego and and Alameda and Swiss and Harvard researchers have done, um, initially discovered by Japanese researcher Yamanaka, who got the Nobel Prize for the way to reboot your uh, epigenes. And uh, um, they're using three of the four Yamanaka factors to do that in um, now starting in humans. Oh my God. Okay. Epigenetic reboot. So that's an epigenetic reboot. So there you can now induced tissue regeneration could eliminate obesity. So I've I've given you to give you another example of it. Uh, our fat, um, our white fat or yellow fat um, comes from a pluripotent fat, which also when we were young went to brown fat. It kept us warm. It uses calories very quickly. Well, imagine taking everyone who's obese or wants to lose weight regressing their white fat into brown fat and having eliminating obesity and all the diseases it causes. Um, So this isn't uh, obese shaming. This is in fact saying you can get rid of all the metabolic sequelae, all the arthritis that obesity causes. Yeah, it's a large, large problem causer. Immunotherapy and immunologic targeting. So just imagine you've got, uh, again, this is one of the silver linings of COVID. We've learned to make vaccines. Well, senile cells produce, as I said, something that makes the cells around them old. 
If we could find out what that is, and they have in mice, and we think we have in humans, and target that with a vaccine so that you eliminate those old cells that way, you're young again. You eliminate all your old cells. Well, I'll tell you the vaccine. Now we're doing. There's also Cleveland Clinic has a test on breast cancer. So old um, breasts, if you will, make a retirement protein. That is, when they get once you get into menopause, they re, they start making a protein that we call retirement protein. You don't need it anymore, but it's breast cancer cells make it. So you target that and you eliminate breast cancer in people after menopause. That's a trial that's now going on in humans at the Cleveland Clinic. Oh my goodness. Okay. Hormetic hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I laid in a, in a hyperbaric chamber at a, at a wellness center and I was kind of freaked out, but I read that it enhances neurogenesis, regrowing your nerves or what? Right. So this is um, done. The, the leading practitioners of this are a guy in... Uh, New Orleans, and then Shai Afradi, who started in Israel and now has centers in Abu Dhabi and the villages in Florida. Um, And they're doing careful studies showing that um, what is hormetic, meaning you go up to two atmospheres, down to one, up to two, down to one, your body thinks you're going from one atmosphere to half an atmosphere. When you're at half an atmosphere, it thinks it's getting to death, so it cuts into a different phase where it recycles old cells and calls for stem cells. And at least in this process, you make your skin young, you make your brain much younger. So that's um, what's happening. And he's, uh, there needs to be more research on it. But again, it appears that we're going to able to recover, just like um, hyperbaric is used for um, wounds that don't heal. It's being used for stroke patients as well as um, normal people to, to have injuries. Oh my goodness. Okay. Microbiome reprogramming. We know that. We all talk about the gut microbiome. We spend a lot of time. So reprogramming means what? Clean it out? Make it- um, it reprogramming means get it to a, a microbiome that fosters youth. Wow. Okay. I'm ready. And this word was really irritating to me because I don't know what it means. Inflammaging, tissue dysfunction. Is that right? So, so whether you're still having sex at 78 compared to 58 or 85, actually, the studies were done compared to 58, and whether um, your brain is still functioning depends on how much inflammation you have. So the most important thing we can do is to, in from an easy standpoint, is to decrease inflammation. Um, and you can talk to your physician about baby aspirin or other things with half a glass of warm water before and after that decrease that your um, monitors highly specific C-reactive protein, MPO, TMAO, IL-6, et cetera. There are a bunch of markers that we go through in the book. Um, and that if you can get those normal, you'd slow your rate of aging considerably maybe even can reverse some of it, some of the damage. Well, let's see. That's super hopeful. We know what bionic bodies are, replacing things with... 3D printed organs, right? Okay. They're now able to to reprogram the kids at Winston-Salem. Team Winston won the prize this year for being able to develop a 3D print a liver, a human liver that functions. So uh, we're getting close. If, If the... It's wonderful what students do. So you asked me about students. Just imagine they had a competition at Winston-Salem University or uh, at, at uh, the university in Winston-Salem. Wakefield. And uh, yeah. what? I think it's Wakefield, but I don't know. Um, um, well, that and, is and so- Team Winston beat Team Salem to uh, who could produce a uh, an artificial liver that functioned, human liver that functioned first. Amazing. Amazing. Now I had a group that hiked for 20 years. It was like eight people and we were young acting. We ate right. None of us really smoked. We'd have a glass of wine. Two of the eight have severe Alzheimer's now. They were like 15 years older than some of us. And they were active people, thinking people, thin people. One has Louis bodies and the other just Alzheimer's, but it's all bad. You said 
proteostasis is a way that we can help fight Alzheimer's. What does that mean? Well, proteostasis is having normal proteins. One of the things we've learned with both Lewy body and some of the other um, dementias, as well as Alzheimer's, they produce abnormal proteins, which trigger inflammation, attacking our immune system says, hey, this shouldn't be here, this abnormal protein, and attacks it and incidentally kills the nerve cells. So that's a part of um, what uh, has been going on. So if we can get normal proteins and not secrete, we think that's what's happening with that therapeutic plasma exchange that we spoke of where you exchange your um, blood, you exchange your, your plasma for clean plasma or for saline and clean plasma. We think that's what's going on. You're getting rid of abnormal proteins, but that's we don't know that. we. So it's in the other category. But the, as you see, there's overlap between the categories and mechanisms. But um, we think that will be um, important in reducing, um, just like in reducing inflammation is important for um, reducing the risk of brain dysfunction. So if you, these are all detailed medical things, ding, 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 ding. We've gone through all 14. I am very proud of us, but as wellness seekers and people who often operate spas, what are some practical things you think we could do now? Because this 14 little quiz we went through proves that you're not making it up. I mean, this isn't just some pie in the sky thing, but typically people can't access these kinds of solutions unless they're very moneyed. So how can we... Wait, have wait, a second, wait a second. Going into five days of a low calorie diet, anyone can do, right? right. Um, if you will, um, using uh, red lights or photomodulation, which does one thing, donating, doing plasma exchange, heck. People, graduate students do that and earn money. That's yeah. plas- that's donation of plasma does the same thing and you get paid for it rather than having to pay for it. So you could do, these things are not expensive to do, um, many of them now, and you can, and clearly physical, ag- doing the four components of physical activity, literally in our, in our Reboot app, there are 160 some things, Reboot Your Age app. Um, and so people want, to find out more about it. It'll be available in July, we expect. Um, So it's at greatagereboot.com and you can uh, write info at greatagereboot.com and sign up for information as soon as it's available. But there are 160 things, you know, there's simple things. One of the things we learned, you know, this is stuff, I don't have any interest in the company that makes this. I don't even know what company makes it, but it is, what? It's creatine. Is that what you're it's holding up? It's in. Well, it turns out, you know, bodybuilders use that, right? But it ends up, it's great for the brain too. When you look at the data, they're randomized controlled trials. So out of the 50 or so supplements that have been sent to us on, does this help? 15 of them have good data that show that people over the age of 50 maybe younger, but that's where the data is. People over the age of 50 get a benefit, sizable benefit from these. So you just With held plasma. up a bottle of creatine. I mean, a bottle of creatine powder, right? Because right. I'm gonna, I'm And so two gram, four grams a day, you know, it probably costs uh, for about uh, half a year, it probably costs 35 bucks. So is it expensive? Well, $35 isn't cheap, but it isn't expensive, right? And if you get a half a year, you know, say 180 days, so $35. So I'm paying, uh, what, $6 a month, um, which is, uh, what, 20 cents a day um, for my brain health, um, if you will, in that way. Um, you know, baby aspirin, I got one here. Um, uh, you, you, get, you can get 10,000 of them. I'm sorry. You can get 2,000 for $10. Um, 2000 is if you if you use two a day is what three years worth for 10 bucks and you were um, using those to cut down inflammation is that it yeah and and so um coffee everyone drinks you know so you can get it pretty cheaply and that cuts down inflammation too dr Royzen? um it is the best at healing the liver decreases 11 cancers 
decreases Parkinson's and Alzheimer's in association studies, multiple association studies by between 20 and 60%. Well, I am really good in that department, in the coffee department. <laughs> but what? you know that thing that I loved when you did your master class with Nancy and Susie and all the really great people that were listening is you gave some tips about emotions and stress that are really anyone can do. And well, you say them, I won't. How would you well, say no, stress is, a, stress is the greatest ager. And so learning how to manage it, you know, whether it's deep breathing or um, finger on your belly button or meditation or guided imagery or progressive muscle, you know, there are 12 techniques that you know better than uh, virtually anyone. But it's the most important thing you can do is to learn how to do it. it is, and friends are key for that. And friends actually take a bunch of work, but it is purpose and posse that are key. You know, I have a, I have a slide. I'm going to show a slide. I didn't, uh, here's my uh, final slide. Oh, you can't see it because I didn't do screen share. Let's see if I can do screen share. I can. Oh, nope, there. you can't. Go ahead, try it. I let. Um, okay, I'm going to see if I can do this. So this is my... Uh, Share. There See you it. go. And it says, change your attitude. You're a genetic engineer. And let me just give you the example. When you do physical activity and stress is a muscle, you turn on a gene that produces arisen. Arisen is a small protein that gets across the brain and increases brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor production, which is like miracle growth for your brain, increases your hippocampal size, decreases your risk of dementia in the long run. Only eat food you love and that loves your body back. We went over that. Choose a team. None of us can do this alone. So whether it is a financial team or a, you know, I think spas should have financial teams associated with them as well. I do too. But it is um, important for your body and brain. And add speed, speed of processing games, speed of uh, that Brain HQ have. Um, maybe other places have it too, speed um, to your exercise. But shown in randomized controlled trials over 10 years to decrease dementia, and improve other things in your body too. I don't understand then, what you mean by adding speed to your body and brain. What do you mean by that? Do a little intense exercise at the end of your period and for your brain. The only thing that matters, it isn't memory games or uh, curiosity games or reasoning games. It is speed of processing games that have been shown to decrease dementia. So it is faster work on, and the two that have been shown double decision and uh, freeze frame and randomized controlled trials to do that. And then manage stress, including cultivating your friends and purpose. Your And that's my phrase, your posse and purpose matter an awful lot. And remember, uh, you can't pour from an empty cup. So you've got to take care of yourself before anyone else. Let me tell you, Dr. Royson, you have made us so proud to have been from Ohio because you're there, you're leading the way. And we're so glad you have this purpose of spreading hope for longevity. And we can't forget that you're determined to change policy too. You've spoken in front of Congress because it shouldn't just be for the elite, right? It should be available. I, I, you know, Congress is the toughest nut to crack, if you will. Um, and it's tough to get them to do things that are rational and save money for the country. You know, it's easier for them to do uh, other things than to than to do something that's rational, like um, Toby Cosgrove got done at the Cleveland Clinic. But if you do it, you know, just imagine if we could reduce spending on health care from 19% of GDP to 6%. We'd have 12% of GDP or 13% of GDP to spend on all the social programs we care about, that would do a lot away with income inequality and wealth inequality. So yes, I, I'm strongly believing in that and, and you know, keep working on it as much as I can. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for re reminding us to use our choices and to never give up hope because 90 can be the new 40 and I'm going to be there with you to experience well, it. Well, I think that with an 80% probability, 90 will be the new 40 within a decade. All right, we're going to hold you to it and keep up the good work because at 100, we're going to still be going strong. We're going to have a lot of communicating to do, okay? Well, well, just imagine, I don't know how old you are now, but at 100, it is likely, more likely than not, that I'm going to be functioning the same way I am now. That's, that's what is, you know, the hope is and what the probability is. This isn't 
crazy ass. This is there's a huge amount of exponential increase in the in research in this area. Well, you know, the book of Ecclesiastes and the Bible that some people read says that God has put time indefinite into our hearts. I think it's deeply embedded in your heart. And thank you for giving us that hope that it could be true. Time indefinite could be true. So we're going to keep kicking. Okay. Thanks for everything, Dr. Royston. Thank you. 